Hello, my name is Vanya Lalek, and today I'll be presenting you the Acholi Beads Micro Business Venture. To begin with, I would like to introduce myself and the individual that helped me establish this business venture in Tanzania. Uh, I'm 22 or 21 years old. Uh, I'm a graduate of the Royal Roads International Hotel Management Program. Uh, I was born overseas in Europe, and I emigrated to Canada in 1998. The reason I went oh, to Africa was because I originally did an internship in Rwanda, which turned into a job. While, in, while I was in Rwanda, I discovered that the uh, micro-business fellowship from Royal Roads was available, and I applied. Uh, once I received confirmation of my acceptance, uh, I told my uh, employers in Rwanda, and in November, or end of October, I moved to Tanzania, and in November we started our language training. The individual that helped me set up this venture is named Carmen Dressler. She's 24 years old, she was born in Canada, and she comes from Alberta. Prior to working in Tanzania, she uh, did her in degree in international hotel management from Royal Roads and worked in a number of different positions. She has management experience and has worked in China, as well as Tanzania. Uh, now, our venture begins with the inspiration of what led us to create this, uh, what led us to adopt this idea? To begin with, we were going to do a village tourism project. The idea for this village tourism project came from um, the experience that I had in Rwanda. I, the company I worked for, we did a lot of work in uh, remote communities, helping them set up their own uh, attractions in their village, to which we would then bring uh, tourists to, and they could earn money this way. Think Thinking that this idea would also be uh, applicable in Tanzania, I decided to submit a request to do this uh, business to the Micro Business Fellowship. Once I got to Tanzania though, however, I realized that this business wouldn't work in this setting. The situation was different, there was too much competition, and the villages in question didn't have the necessary attractions to bring in the type of tourists that was coming to the Moshi area. The tourists that were coming to the Moshi area generally wanted they went there to do safaris and to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. For them, uh, if they were to do a cultural outing, it would mostly, most likely be with the Maasai people, who already have a number of projects established in the region. We, however, were working with the Chaga people, and we felt that we couldn't establish this project and leave it once, when leave it once we're gone, and make it uh, vi uh, viable. Um, so we decided to look for something else. The Acholi beads idea uh, came to us uh, when we were discussing what else we, we can do. These beads, we saw them throughout East Africa. I saw them in Rwanda and Uganda and Kenya. We did some research on the internet and we found out how to make them. And one day we decided to gather a bunch of materials, start cutting and rolling and pasting to see if we can make these beads. Once we got the trial down, we realized that we could quite possibly implement this in one of the villages surrounding Moshi and give individuals in the villages and in the community a chance to earn some money. So. I'm going to skip forward now to the entrepreneur that we chose. Her name is Rahima Lima. She's 38 years old and she's a grandmother. She did not finish primary school, stopped her education at uh, primary five, and she now has a family with a husband and four children, as well as a grandchild. Uh, she lives in Mudio village and her husband happens to be the chairman of that village. She is very intelligent and very bright uh, she's forward, foc focus, forward focused, and she's shown on numerous occasions that she'd be uh, more than able to do the job that we asked of her. Upon arriving in her village, actually, to inform her that we selected her for this business, we walked into her house and there was a group of people there. Surprised th to see so many people, we asked her what this was about. It turns out, unbeknownst to us, that Rahima had actually set up a microcredit organization of 45 women in her community, all by herself. We were deeply impressed and we realized that Rahima would be the perfect entrepreneur for our venture. So, the startup process. We went through what I call the three stages of the startup process. The first stage we did sales research. We really had a tough time with this because we went to a lot of different shops looking for information. How much can we sell to you? What price will you buy it at? How much volume can then you sell to your, your clients? When is the high season? When is the low season? At first, we were focusing primarily on this being a good that's sold to tourists. Later on, we began to realize that there was a very large domestic market for it as well. In the beginning, we had people tell us, 
For example, one gentleman would tell us, would be very surprised, he would never have seen these before, and he's, he would say, I would pay you 2,000 or 2,500 shillings for one piece. Then we would have, we'd go to a next shop, and somebody would say, these are garbage, I wouldn't even buy them for 500, and so on. So we had a lot of different uh, variations in what people were going to do, or what people were going to, how much they were going to pay if they were willing to pay. We realized, though, however, the ones that were lowballing us usually were the ones that wanted to buy. They just wanted to have a better price. That's one of the cultural problems of working in Tanzania. So, once we uh, established a general idea of how much we can sell it for and how much we can make, how much our entrepreneurs can make, we realized that this could be a profitable venture. So we went around getting supplies. Now you'd think that to get five supplies, beads, glue, clasps, thread, and the magazine paper would be fairly easy. However, in Tanzania, life is a little bit more difficult when it comes to starting a business. Uh, the materials we went to buy, we went to buy them three separate times. The first time we went, uh, it was me and Carmen, and we, got, we paid more than double what we should have paid because the vendor knew that we didn't know the actual price and that as there's no price stickers anywhere, he decided he could milk us for our money and charge double. We had to buy the supplies because we needed to start creating some demos to show people. So we bought them. The second time we went, we went with uh, a local to a different shop. We managed to bargain them down, but we still weren't paying what we thought was the fair price for these goods. Finally, we ended up talking to a lady that owns a shop selling um, tourist goods, uh, handicrafts, paintings, bracelets, necklaces, other things like that. She'd actually worked in America, and she was familiar with the business culture of North America. So she told us, I get my supplies from this location. She told me the location, told me how to get there, and I went there with, a, with another local, and we got the same price that she got for her supplies. We were very happy about this. We realized that in Tanzania, you can do business, but you just need somebody local to help you work out the cultural differences and help you steer clear of those people that are trying to rip you off. Finally, once we had our supplies, we could start to work with our entrepreneur. Rahima was very excited to work. And when we came up to Medio to work with her, there was already a group of women, that are, women and men that had gathered on the first day to see what we were going to teach them. As we started to work, we quickly realized that there was way too many people, and the materials, we brought enough materials for 12 people to start working, so we could teach 12 people. We, we had maybe 50 or 60 on that first day. By the second day, we realized it's too chaotic. We got to somehow uh, manage this and tone it down and get groups in at different times so we can teach them all, but not have everybody running around. So we did that, and Rahima was very keen on organizing everybody. It was through her that we were able to organize smaller groups of women that we could teach, then have them leave, have another group come in, and then we could teach them, and then have them leave, and so on. She really is the person behind this that's going to make this business successful. The third day, oddly enough, we were talking about marketing, how we're going to sell it, where we're going to sell it to. And Rahima, and we're talking to Rahima, and Rahima says, okay, great, no problem, I know all that. She comes back a few hours later, and she tells me, I've just, played, I've just got somebody to place an order, for a wedding. They want 30 bracelets, 30 necklaces. I have somebody, a relative, that has a shop in Dar es Salaam that wants this amount made for the next morning. We need to have it made so she can take it and sell it. I have somebody that wants to sell these in India. I have somebody that wants to buy 10 pieces of this color because they match a the color of the ruling party and they want to wear ruling party bracelets. When we looked at her and we realized she is a born entrepreneur. She was meant for this business. She's done, in that one day, she's pulled more connections, more strings to sell more goods than we did the whole time we were there for her. So I want to talk about the impacts and the benefits of this business. To begin with, I need to explain to you what the life of an average rural inhabitant in, Tan in Tanzania is like. If they have land, and they usually have some livestock, they can do okay. They have enough to eat, they have enough to survive. The problem is, they don't have enough capital. They can't accumulate capital fast enough to make productive investments in their future. Generally, these productive investments are education and training for either themselves or their children, or, for example, buying better livestock or more livestock, buying fertilizer. These things are difficult sometimes. A farm so, in terms of monetary benefits, this business then allows individuals, mostly women, to come to Rahima's house. They can make roll beads as much as they want, they make a certain amount of money for every bead they make, and then they can go home and use that money for whatever pressing need came up. Let's say their children's school uniform just got ripped. Their child can't go to school without a school uniform. 
they'll be kicked out. So they have to buy a new uniform, but they don't have any money. All they have is the food they saved up after the harvest to eat for this until the next harvest comes in. And generally that's the case of most peasants, in, not just in Tanzania, but throughout the developing world. So the farmers, these women, they can then come to Rahima, they can work for two or three days, make enough money and buy their child a school uniform. They don't have to go selling the food that they would themselves eat. They don't have to go ask neighbors for money. They can come, they can work, and they can get the money. So it's a really decentralized way of working. We don't have schedules. You know, People come in, they drop in when they can, when they want. They can work, make some money, and leave. It's a little bit difficult for the entrepreneur to balance this, but also I, we think that because the, the, these women make so many beads, you know, Rahima always has a stash of beads that she, she can use to make more necklaces, more bracelets. You know, the, women's are, the women are very fast when it comes to working because they know that they get paid by the piece. There was, also, there was also one other benefit that came up that we, this is sort of, for now, we thought of it almost as an afterthought, but I realized that this is key to making this business successful. You see, the workers themselves, when they come and they roll the beads, for them, it's not just work. They're actually socializing. You know, we would have groups of 10 to 15 women come. One would be breastfeeding. Another would be talking about her son's education. A third would be doing something else. But they would all be working and rolling at the same time. And for them, it was a way to connect, to share news, to do something in that downtime, which you usually find in villages between the harvests, when there's nothing to do. You know, you, you, you don't have anything to do. You've done all your chores for the day. You would just sit there for hours not doing anything. These women now have the chance to come to Rahimas, they can socialize, they can talk, they can work together, and they can make money at the same time. Now, another, another benefit to this is, I spoke earlier about the microfinance group that Rahima established. This microfinance group now uses our work time as a chance to do informal meetings. So women can talk about their business projects. They don't have to wait for the once weekly meeting on the, in the weekend. They can now come when they're working and talk to each other. So it's another great way of helping cement the relationships they already established with their microfinance program. So I think this, this venture ties it in nicely. Now, in terms of sustainability, Rahima is the key to making this business last. She has shown herself more than capable of finding new markets, as I mentioned before, and she's very keen on pushing this business into the future. Another key aspect of sustainability are the women workers that come there. For them, like I said before, it's not just work, it's a place to socialize, it's a place to exchange ideas, it's a place to talk about business ventures they want to try. And it's also a place to earn the capital for their business ventures. Now, with sustainability, uh, we established a system where one of our associates, Harriet, from Tanzania, we, we would email her with questions, we would Skype her, and then she would, because she works with our entrepreneurs through KCMC, we will be able to, through her, talk to our entrepreneurs, judge how they're doing. If they have any problems, they can come to her, she can email us, we can respond. This can usually be done within a few days. So we are trying to keep in touch with our entrepreneurs through the internet, through Skype, and through our local associates on the ground. The problem with this is our entrepreneurs don't have internet, computers, or sometimes even electricity where they are. So it's quite hard to get a message out. And sometimes you know, there might be a missed opportunity because it takes so long for a message to get out. This is definitely a stumbling block that we need to somehow address. We're hoping that in the future, once these businesses really start making a profit, our entrepreneurs will invest in things like a computer, you know, like internet, because they, it's available, they just can't afford it. And I'm sure that if given the chance, they would want to use all of the modern uh, appliances that we have in Canada and North America and Western Europe. It's just a question of money we're hoping our business will be able to address that question. So, so some of the challenges that we encountered, uh, definitely we'd have to say that language was the biggest barrier. In the uh, Mudio region, or actually in the Moshi area, Moshi Arusha area, the predominant tribe are the Chaga people. Uh, for them, their language, their first language is Kichaga. Then they would learn Swahili. And then after that, as their third language, they would learn English. Now me, being English as a second language speaker, also learning Swahili as my third language, our conversations were very blurred and very confused most of the time. It was very hard to explain to people, you, I need you to do this, or for them to tell me, no, let's do it this way because it's better, and so on. It was hard to have a concrete discussion with them because we'd always be looking for translators, and words would get lost in translation. Another challenge is definitely the transportation to Modillo and back. You know, 
For Rahima, she has to go into town to sell her goods most of the time. So she has to pay a couple of dollars every time she goes into town to sell her goods. And you know, this does hit her profit margin a little bit. And it does hurt in that sense. Transportation and lack of communication, as I spoke before about the lack of internet and the uh, sometimes lack of electricity due to blackouts. The highlights. Now, I would definitely say there have been many, many highlights to this trip. But I think the thing that stands out to me the most was on the last day, my last day in Modillo, I was coming down the mountain because Modillo is up uh, on the foot in the foothills of Kilimanjaro. So it's quite high up. It's about five, five, four, five, six kilometers up the up the mountain away from the nearest road. And as I was coming down on a motorcycle down one of these paths down to the uh, down to the road, the chairman of the village, who's also Rahima's husband, he points to the side and he says, you see this house? That's mama so-and-so. She's the one that comes at eight in the morning, nine in the morning to do work, to make a little bit of money. And I thought, really? From that far, she walks five kilometers every morning after she's done her morning chores just to go there to work, make maybe a thousand, thousand five hundred shillings, which is a dollar, and go home. And she's happy. She's always the happiest one there. And that's when it really hit me that something, the things that we're doing here are making a tangible difference. And that, I guess that, I could say, was the highlight of my trip.